This is a 1989 Dodge Dakota Sport Convertible, and it's a Dodge Dakota pickup truck that's also a convertible. Yes, this is real, and yes, this is factory. You could walk into a Dodge dealer in 1989 and buy a convertible pickup truck. And today, I'm going to review it. Before I get started, big news, this Dodge Dakota Sport Convertible is currently for sale, being auctioned live on cars and bids. That's right, this could be your chance to buy the ultra rare, ridiculous, crazy Dodge Dakota Convertible. So once you're finished watching this video, click the link in the description below to head over to the live auction for this Dodge Dakota Convertible, where you can bid and buy this crazy vehicle only on cars and bids. So let's talk Dakota convertible. In the late 1980s, the Dodge Dakota debuted as Dodge's small pickup truck below the Ram in its truck lineup. A few years later, they decided to come out with a convertible. This idea was surely not supported by any market research or well, rationality, frankly, but they did it. The majority of Dakota convertibles were 1989 models like this one, and the vast majority were Dakota sport convertibles, with a few cosmetic upgrades over the regular Dakota to make them seem sporty and more exciting. Amazingly, Dodge built around 3,000 Dakota convertibles, although I suspect maybe only a few hundred survive today. And this is one of that few hundred, a pickup truck that's also a convertible. Chevy tried this years later with the SSR, which was sort of a hot rod pickup truck convertible thing, and that was also a dismal failure. But the mere concept of a convertible pickup truck is weird and quirky, and so I love it. And today, I'm going to show it to you. First, I'll take you on a tour of the Dakota Sport Convertible and show you all of its interesting quirks and features. Then I'll get it out on the road and drive it, and then I'll give it a Doug score. All right, I'm going to start the quirks and features of the Dakota Convertible in the most obvious place. That means starting with the roof, and I'm going to cover putting it down, which is very easy, as you might expect. You just drop the sun visor out of place, and it reveals like this little latch. You just move the latch to the side, and then you do the same thing over on the other side of the passenger side, two latches, and then the roof just goes down manually. You just kind of push it down, and it goes down, and it rests back there, and then your Dakota is in convertible mode. Obviously not as simple as a nice power operated top but super easy to do you can drop it in like five seconds while you're sitting in a traffic light now when the roof is down it reveals one of the most ridiculous things about this truck and that would be the giant roll bar that's fixed in place behind the seats the roll bar isn't very attractive or well integrated but it's a necessary component because the windshield of the truck isn't supportive so the roll bar provided safety protection in a rollover accident at least there's a little vinyl covering over it with a zipper strangely <laughs> the vinyl makes it look a little nicer than just an ugly metal roll bar sticking out, but truthfully, it doesn't help that much. Now, if you're familiar with convertibles, you might be surprised to hear the windshield isn't supportive, because in most convertibles it is, or at least partially, but not here because of the way this truck was built. These were built as normal Dakotas, and then sent to ASC, which stood for American Sunroof Corporation. They did a lot of convertible conversions for automakers back in the 1980s and 90s, including famously the ASC Mustang and also others. ASC would make the Dakota into a convertible, and then send it off to Dodge dealers where it could be sold as a new Dakota with a convertible top. That meant the windshield was just the regular one from the normal Dakota, which wasn't structurally reinforced, so it couldn't really support the truck's weight in a rollover crash. Now, another interesting drawback of the convertible situation in this truck is when you put the roof down, it goes into the bed. You can see it just sort of sits there on top of the bed cover in this case, and that presented some issues. For one, if you wanted to drive the truck with a convertible top down, you couldn't use the entire bed because now the convertible top is taking up like maybe a quarter of it. Also, you couldn't put a camper top on your Dakota. Campers were very popular in the 80s, the early 90s, but you couldn't stick one here because the roof would go down. And obviously, if a camper was sitting on the bed, you had nowhere to store the roof. And so you couldn't put the convertible top down if you had a camper on the back, which was not ideal. Now, in terms of putting the roof back up, it is, as you might expect, just as easy as putting it down. You basically grab onto the roof and sort of lift it into place. You can see it takes a couple of seconds and it's incredibly easy. 
and then it's sitting at the top of the windshield and you just latch those latches again, the opposite of what you did to put it down, and then the roof is back in place. Again, not as fancy or as easy as an electric top, but tremendously quick and frankly, quite easy to do. Now, with the roof in place, you can see a couple of interesting things here. For one, you have this plastic back window, which made sense to have in a convertible since the roof would fold. You didn't want like a hard window back there. It's easier to fold plastic. Also interesting, when the roof is in place, you can see it comes to like a 90 degree angle in the back of it. Now, the reason they did that, I suspect, is so that it would fit around the roll bar, which was in place, and also to give you more headroom when you were sitting in the interior, rather than like a flowing back convertible like a lot of sports cars are. But one interesting result of this is that when the convertible roof is in place, it doesn't really look that much like a convertible, at least from outside. If you look at it, you can see maybe it looks like a regular Dakota with a black painted top or with one of those vinyl Landau tops or something. You wouldn't necessarily assume that it was a convertible seeing it in this position, unless of course the roof was down. Now, a convertible top on a pickup truck <laughs> obviously creates a little bit of an issue with chassis rigidity. Pickup trucks in general already have this problem because the cab and the bed are not like linked up. They're instead both kind of riding on a frame. But when you take the roof off, you remove even more rigidity from the cab. And so that was a common complaint of this truck that it didn't feel very structurally rigid. How do I feel? I don't know. We'll find out when I go drive it. The craziest thing about the whole convertible situation with this truck is why? Why did they do it? I often wonder why, and I've never come up with a great explanation. You know, they also did a Shelby version of the Dodge Dakota, like a high-performance version, back in that era when no one was making high-performance pickup trucks. And I strongly suspect the reason they did both of them was just to experiment, see if either of these things might work. And if they did, well, maybe they've created a whole new market segment. Obviously, this didn't. <laughs> they only sold about 3,000 of these, and they were not easy sells, but it was an idea. It was a thought, the convertible pickup truck. But for all the weirdness of this vehicle around having a convertible top, it's worth noting that it was still a legitimate pickup truck. You got your pickup truck tailgate back here, you drop it, and you get access to your pickup truck bed, as you can see. And if you take off the bed cover, you can use this to do pickup truck stuff. In fact, the owner of this truck has told me that he has hauled stuff stuff with it, thrown like stone in the back for a house project that he needed in his convertible pickup truck Dakota. Like I said, these were built as regular Dakota models and converted later, so no surprise, it is a regular pickup truck. But while you could use the Dakota convertible for truck stuff, you couldn't use it for much truck stuff. You see, the Dakota convertible models came standard with a 3.9 liter V6. That was an optional engine on the regular Dakota, but it was standard here. However, it only made about 130 horsepower. It was not a tremendously powerful engine. Although to be fair, this was not a tremendously heavy or large pickup truck, but still not a huge powertrain from this vehicle. Now, amazingly, the regular Durango was also offered with a 2.2 liter four cylinder that made only 96 horsepower. So this engine was like the muscle car engine compared to that, but that four cylinder was never available in the convertible. If you were getting the convertible, you were getting the V6. Now, when you look into this engine bay, you can see there is a lot of room left in here in case they wanted to drop in a larger engine. And in fact, they later did. The Dakota was later offered with a 5.2 liter V8, which finally took things over 200 horsepower. But unfortunately, by that time, the convertible was long gone. That engine was only available on regular Dakota models, so you can never get a convertible and a V8 although that would have been cool. But anyway, next up we move back inside the Dakota convertible, and the first thing you notice when you climb in here is it's red, really, really red. Every surface of this interior is red colored back in the era when primarily American cars used to have these colored interiors, reds and blues, and of course they look tremendously dated by modern standards, but it was normal back then. The weird part about this one is none of the reds in this interior really match. For instance, the seatbelt red does not match the red on the seat, even though they're right next to each other. My favorite is that the steering wheel center red does not match the red on the rest of the steering wheel, even though those pieces are right next to each other. You knew you were going to be seeing that all the time and it wouldn't match, but Chrysler was like, eh, just let it go anyway. And none of the reds in this interior match the red on the outside of the truck, which was a brighter, more vibrant red. So you had like a bright red exterior and sort of a darker red interior, <laughs> two different shades of red, although actually like 
10 different shades of red when you really start looking at everything. And to be clear, they really committed to the red in this interior. You even have a piece of red cloth at the base of the turn signal stock for some reason on the steering column. That could have just been black, black plastic, but no, red to match everything else. Although again, slightly different shade from all the other red pieces. But anyway, next up onto the rest of the quirks and features in this interior. One interesting item, when you open the door, you can instantly see a little plaque that reads, quality engineered by Chrysler Corporation. Uh, yeah, I'm not entirely sure that that provided the assurance that they were hoping that it did. <laughs> if I saw that there, I would say, huh, what? <laughs> That's not necessarily a good thing, but it was there for whatever pride you had in Chrysler, <laughs> that little label. Next up, here's a rather cool feature actually. To the left of the steering wheel, there's a little handle labeled vent. If you pull that, it will open up a little vent in the driver's foot well, and then you're driving along, you get fresh air blown in on like your legs and that area, that's a pretty cool feature to have. So you can have the climate control going from the main vents, but you can have this extra vent blowing fresh air kind of just onto your lower half, and that's pretty cool. Now, next up, you can see the gear selector mounted on the column. This has an automatic transmission, although it's worth noting a manual transmission was standard in the Dakota convertible models. So theoretically, you can find one of these with a stick shift out there, although this one has the auto. Now, four-wheel drive was also optional in the Dakota convertible. This is a two-wheel drive model, but you could get four-wheel drive drive, which would have been pretty nice. Four-wheel drive off-roading in your convertible pickup. Next up, worth noting this front seat here obviously is a front bench seat, and it has three separate seat belts. So you can have three people up here, front, middle, and then passenger side, or the middle seat could also be converted into an armrest. You have this velour armrest that drops down, and you could rest your arm on it if you don't have a middle passenger that you have to be carrying around. Next up, this particular Dakota Sport convertible still has its original stereo, which is not particularly easy to find. These were in a lot of Chrysler models from this era, only a cassette player and obviously AM, FM radio. The thing I loved about these Chrysler stereos from back then is the sound positioner was so easy. This little joystick, you moved it up and then all the sound was in the front speakers. You moved it back and all the sound was in the rear speakers. And of course you could also do side to side. It was so much easier than like going into a little screen on a menu and tapping little buttons. You just had a little joystick. You could place the sound instantly wherever you wanted. That was pretty cool. Now also in the center control stack, you can see here this truck has air conditioning which was a pretty cool feature at the time. Not everything at this price point had it, but this truck does. It also has power windows, as you can see on the door panel here, and power door locks, which is nice to have, although it doesn't have power mirrors. If you were adjusting the mirror, you were using this little mirror joystick on the driver or passenger side to get the mirror into place. Next up, another nice touch in this interior is over on the passenger side on the dashboard, you have this sort of aluminum trim panel that looks tough and says Dakota on it, and it includes hidden cup holders. You pull on the Dakota and cup holders pop out so you can store your drinks while you drive. Again, not very common in the late 1980s, but this truck had it. This truck also had a nice little storage feature. Below the seats, you had a little storage net down here so you could store stuff in case your glove box was full, you wanted a little bit more room. Obviously, a pickup truck bed is not the ideal place to store small items, so you had this little storage net, which was nice. Unfortunately, one thing you didn't have in this truck was headrests. You can see the seats only go up to like the middle of your back. So if you're in a serious collision, you better hope that your head hits the roll bar and you get like a concussion as opposed to your head going all the way back and like your neck snapping because there's no headrest in here. That level of safety equipment, safety research hadn't quite been done. Headrests were not as common back in the late 80s as they are now. And next up we move outside the Dakota Sport Convertible. And it's worth noting that the vast majority of these Dakota Convertible models were indeed Dakota sports, which basically meant they had this little graphic down the side that said Dakota Sport, and they usually had two-tone paint, which made them look cooler. They also had special wheels that were sportier than the ones on the regular Dakota. There were regular Dakota convertibles that were not sport models, but they're very rare. The vast majority were sports like this, as you can see. Now, this particular Dakota Sport has been sportified compared to the original. It has a body kit, it has aftermarket wheels, and 
and it's been lowered compared to the factory ride height. Now, the vast majority of times I don't review cars that have been modified, but I made an exception here for two reasons. Number one, I'm not getting a lot of offers to review Dakota convertibles, and I thought this would probably be my only chance. But most importantly, number two, most of these modifications were made in the period. Specifically, the body kit was put on basically when this truck was new. It was only a year or two old when this body kit was added. So it was like a period modification, period correct, you could call it. And frankly, I don't think it looks that bad. I think it's actually pretty good on the side, the front. You can see this body kit making it look sportier. And you can just imagine the dude who bought this new, all proud of his convertible Dakota, going into a body shop in 1990 and saying, I want this body kit put on my convertible Dakota. <laughs> he probably thought he was the coolest dude in the world. And frankly, he kind of was. Now, aside from the convertible top and the Dakota sportness, there wasn't that much quirky or interesting on the outside of this truck. A couple of items worth noting. One, the Dodge logos in the bumper molded into the plastic to give it a little bit of extra toughness, if you're looking closely at the bumper anyway. I also love the fact that on the front fender mounted here, it says V6. 3.9 liter. Like telling you this little truck has a V6 and a pretty big V6, so you should respect it. American companies were really excited to put the liter output of their engines on badges on their vehicles during this period, but they would never have advertised the horsepower, 130 horses. <laughs> they just wanted you to respect the size of the engine, even if it wasn't really that powerful. Kind of funny to see that proud badge. And so those are the quirks and features of the Dodge Dakota Sport convertible. Now it's time to get it out on the road and see how it drives. All right, driving the Dakota convertible. I've always wanted to drive one of these. I drove it for about the last 30 minutes with the roof off, and now I will try it with the roof on. First impression, I was making fun of the engine power earlier. It actually isn't so bad. Obviously, this truck isn't like fast. Like no one would say, oh, it's a sports car, but it's a little simple truck. And I think that level of power and probably decent torque contributes to it actually being somewhat kind of peppy and eager. Uh, more than much more than I expected. Next up, I want to talk about the cowl shake and the rigidity in this truck. A lot of people comment on that being an absolute disaster of this vehicle because a truck is already not very rigid and then they've removed the roof. Uh, I gotta tell you, I'm kind of surprised by it. It's not as bad as I expected it would be. It ain't good, but I really thought this would be like laughable, like it would feel like a noodle, like people say. Truthfully, I thought the Murano Cross Cabriolet was worse in terms of chassis rigidity. You had a lot more cowl shake in that, and it just felt less balanced when you were turning. You felt like the car was kind of twisting. With that said, uh, steering and handling, not exactly great in this car. Uh, the steering is not particularly well connected or sporty or quick to turn. Uh, and handling isn't exactly great either. Now, this one is a little bit better because it's been lowered. And so I feel like it turns a little bit better than I might expect from an 80s pickup truck. But compared to like a sports car, it's not exactly fantastic. Now, the owner of this truck tells me, surprisingly, you get an enormous amount of interest from people on the road. And I said to him, you know, do people know what it is? And he said, occasionally someone will come up, oh, I had one of those, oh, my dad had one of those, my brother, whatever, you know, and they'll kind of remember. I also asked him the big question that I would ask anyone buying this vehicle, which is, why did you buy this vehicle? And he told me his, he wanted a truck, his wife wanted a convertible, and thus it began. <laughs> So it actually worked out okay, they got both. And I gotta tell you, I am I like convertibles. I own two convertibles myself. They're both SUV convertibles, which is already sort of a weird thing. Um, I like convertible vehicles. And so to me, this is kind of cool. Driving with the roof down, I thought it was pretty neat. You drive in a convertible and you can still use the bed for truck stuff, even though you can't quite use it for truck stuff as much as you would if the convertible top didn't go into the bed or if it was a full-size truck or whatever, it's still decent. Now this truck has 93,000 miles on it. Um, it's a reasonably nice Dakota Sport convertible. Uh, it isn't perfect by any stretch, but I will say it's getting harder and harder to find one of these. If you want a Dakota Sport convertible, uh, you don't have that many options. Truthfully, there's not that much more to say about it. I mean, it, it, otherwise there's a lot of, you know, 80s American car stuff, frankly, it kind of feels a lot like that. Um, 
you know, the interior's not great, but it's held up well, surprisingly. It looks like an 80s American car interior. The sounds, you know, the smells, that sort of thing, are all sort of 80s American car. The really cool part is undoubtedly the convertible top and the sheer rarity of these. They built 3,000, almost all of them in 89, but they had made a contract with American Sunroof Corporation to build 3,000, and they didn't sell them all in 89, and so they had to build 1990 and even a few 91 models in order to fulfill the contract. But by then, no one was buying them. It just wasn't a popular segment, obviously. <laughs> Nobody really wants a convertible truck. One funny thing though is, I think that there's some possibility that a convertible truck could make sense today. Trucks have become a lot more of a lifestyle thing. Uh, people are willing to spend a lot more money on trucks. Nobody's gonna try it again because people are, you know, they saw the Dakota fail, they saw the SSR fail, they're not gonna do another convertible truck. But I wouldn't be shocked if today it sells at least okay as opposed to the failure that this and the SSR was. But back then it was a total flop and now just driving it, the sheer novelty is hilarious. And so that's the Dodge Dakota Sport Convertible. This is incredibly weird. Weird that they made it, weird that anyone bought it, frankly, and it's always been one of those really odd, strange cars that I have always wanted to review. And if you share my appreciation for the ridiculousness of it, you can buy it on Cars and Bids. Anyway, now it's time to give the Dakota Sport Convertible a Doug score. Starting with the weekend categories and styling, the Dakota Convertible is pretty ridiculous and it's downright weird with the roof down, that roll bar in place, and it gets a 4 out of 10. Acceleration, I'm not sure what the 0 to 60 time is, but it ain't fast, and it gets a 1 out of 10. Handling is okay, normal for a car like this, but not ideal by modern standards, with lazy steering and play in the suspension, it gets a 2 out of 10. Fun factor is a bit higher, it's not fast or sharp around corners, but you're driving a weird mobile with a convertible top, and it gets a 3 out of 10. Cool factor is also pretty high, I'd be thrilled if I saw one of these at cars and coffee. Most people won't know, but these have something of a cult following, and it gets a 5 out of 10 for a total weekend score of 15 out of 50. Next up are the daily categories and features. It's only got the basics, and it gets a 2 out of 10. Comfort is average for a late 80s pickup truck, and it gets a 4 out of 10. Quality is also average. Chrysler from this era wasn't known for great reliability, and the materials aren't exactly amazing, but it's easy to work on. Parts are cheap, and it gets a 5 out of 10. Practicality, three seats and a single cab aren't great, but a truck bed always helps with practicality, and it gets a 4 out of 10. Finally, value, and it's amazing to me. These sell for 10 grand or so, a little less, a little more, depending on condition, and frankly, I think that's a bit of a bargain to drive such a weird and increasingly like car geek, cult popular car, especially given how rare these are, and it gets a 7 out of 10 for a total daily score of 22 out of 50. Added up in the Doug score is 37 out of 100, which places the Dakota convertible here against some other weird trucks and some cars from this area. It's dead last, but most of the rivals are way newer and more refined. The Dakota convertible is absolutely bizarre, and it has a narrow appeal, but the weirdness certainly appeals to me. 